more than 160 million miles from Earth, an aircraft is sitting on an alien world, waiting to make history. NASA's Ingenuity helicopter, which traveled to Mars with the Perseverance rover, will soon attempt the first powered flight on another planet. I'm so happy to welcome today Farah Alabay. She is a systems engineer at NASA, and she's also the Perseverance Integration Lead for Ingenuity, the Mars helicopter. Thank you so much for coming to talk to us during what must be a very busy time. Yeah, thank you for having me. So, you know, getting into Perseverance and Ingenuity, I just was so captivated by the footage of Perseverance, and if our viewers haven't seen it, they should definitely watch it. But it's got a little buddy, <laughs> this little helicopter. <laughs> So tell us about Ingenuity and, you know, even though you've worked on some very cool projects like Mars Insight and things like this, is this like the coolest thing you've ever worked on? It's definitely the craziest thing I've ever worked on um, <laughs> and the cutest thing, I guess. That um, So Ingenuity <laughs> is a technology demonstration. It's a small helicopter, weighs about four pounds and its blades are about four feet long. Um, and until very recently, it was tucked under the belly of the rover horizontally. And over the past 10 days or so, we took it from that position all the way to vertical. And over the weekend, we dropped it on the surface of Mars. And now it's starting its month of technology demonstration. And what we hope to do is demonstrate the first powered flight on another planet. And that's what I mean by crazy, right? Like we haven't been flying on Earth for all that long. And now we've gone to a whole other planet, millions of miles away, and we're gonna attempt to fly. And flying on Mars is not going to be easy. Now, the gravity on Mars is about a third of that of the Earth. So in that sense, it weighs less on Mars. It's lighter. But the atmosphere is only 1% of the Earth's atmosphere. And so on Earth, when we fly, it's really the atmosphere. It's the air that lifts you up, right? It's that the force that lifts up a, a helicopter or a plane. So we have 1% of that on Mars and somehow we're saying, yeah, we're gonna go to this other planet and just do this, right? Um, and, and we think it's gonna work. We think physics works a certain way, but either way, we're gonna learn a whole lot. Um, and that's, that's the goal of this. We're just trying to show that we can fly somewhere else and what it takes. And we wanna understand you know, all the complexities of doing that on Mars. That's so fascinating. The first powered flight on another world. And, you know, it's, I got to ask uh, that one of the things I loved that was included on this helicopter was a little piece of the Wright Flyer, the Wright Brothers plane with the first powered flight on Earth. And this is just that next historic milestone. So what does it feel for you and your colleagues to be kind of on the cusp of another unprecedented milestone in the history of flight? It is definitely really humbling to be part of this team. I mean, I know it's kind of, it's, I think we're all a little nervous, we're excited. Um, I mean, the work has been put in, the work has been done. All we can do now is, you know, take our shot and see what happens. It's been incredible also to see the world follow along with us, to be so engaged and behind us. And we're definitely feeling everyone's energy and, and support in, in what we're trying to attempt. What's that flight gonna look like? How far is it going? How high is it going? Uh, tell us about what that will be like. So we're taking baby steps. So that first flight, we're actually just going to go up and down. So we're going to try and go up approximately three meters and then come back down. And so, you know, like anything, we're not going to run first. And so that's that's really what we're trying to achieve is just go up. And then as the flights go by during the month, we're going to get more and more ambitious. So we'll try and fly a little higher and then try and traverse and come back, for example. So really that first step, all we want to do is be able to take off, be stable and then come back down. And if we can achieve that, it's actually mission accomplished and everything else after that is kind of the cherry on top of the cake. Right, because as you mentioned, it's like, it's such a weird place to fly with no very little air pressure and things like that. So that will be, I guess, a, an amazing moment just to be able to see that. Um, yeah, I mean, it's not just the lack of atmosphere, right? It, it's not like we have a helicopter pad that's like nice and flat. Yeah, we found an area that's fairly flat that has little rocks, but enough features for us to traverse. But um, there's that that's complicated. The whole flight has to be entirely automated. It's we're too far away to be able to do anything about this flight. The winds on Mars are, are different from Earth. So we've been studying the weather. We've been trying to understand 
um, how, what that might look like. There's just a lot of factors that are different than Earth that we're learning kind of as we go here. And that those are all going to become key on, on that first flight, Saul. That's so cool. So say everything is great, it flies well, um, how far eventually might it go? Um, and, you know, is it going to be helping perseverance in any way or is it just by itself a test demonstration of, of flight? So ingenuity is only a tech demo. So it's it's only going to be demonstrating flight. And so, you know, we have 30 sols, 30 Martian days to achieve that. We're going to try and attempt more and more complex flights. Um, but at the end of the day, it is a limited time. After those 30 sols, we have to get back to our own mission, uh, which, you know, Perseverance has some incredible goals by itself. Um, and so that that's kind of the story there. Uh, but for sure, we're going to be learning a whole lot about what it takes to fly on Mars in those in the next month or so here. So uh, Ingenuity could take this first flight as soon as Sunday. When will we know here on Earth uh, what how it went and, and what happened? So it's going to take a few hours after that flight for us to get that information. The way that we do operations at Mars is that we actually plan everything ahead of time. We actually I work during the Martian night. Um, and so we plan everything ahead of time and then send up a plan to the rover in the morning. As part of that plan, the rover has a set of activities for itself, and then it transfers over a set of activities to the helicopter. So the rover and the helicopter have the ability to talk to each other. So what would happen is that at a certain predefined time of day, we would have planned to talk to the helicopter. We'll transfer over commands to the helicopter saying pretty much like, hey, go ahead and fly now. Do you know this this sequence? Um, during that time, the rover is going to be hopefully imaging, hopefully taking a video even, and then the helicopter is going to be doing its flight, land down, hopefully send back information to the rover as it's doing that, and it's going to continue to send information even after its flight. All of that will get packaged, and then later in the day, uh, we actually send data back to Earth via one of our orbiters so that we can send a lot more data. How funny that you have to be living on Mars time. I mean, that is just a <laughs> trip. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I have a different app on my phone that tells me exactly what time it is on Mars. It's actually, you know, early morning on Mars right now. But the craziest thing is that um, Mars time, you know, Mars day is actually 24 hours and 40 minutes, more or less. So even though I start at the same time on Mars every day, I start around 6 p.m. Martian time every day, my day actually shifts by 40 minutes every day. Oh, that's so funny. I mean, do you guys get Martian jet lag? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, so my day shifts by 40 minutes every day, so I pretty much have jet lag every single day. You know how we all complain about the clocks moving an hour? Um, and, and it just happened during Martian time, and all my friends are complaining, and I'm like, stop talking, right? I have to do this every single day. Um, <laughs> it does mean that my day's a little longer, so I guess I get a little bit more sleep every day. Um, but uh, but also, it means that I'm losing you know, every every month or so, I lose a day of my life because because I've lived like 30 days on Mars, but it's been 31 days on Earth, and somehow I've lost a whole day. Um, so we're going to be doing this for about 90 sols, 90 Martian days, that, that sort of rhythm. Um, and then that whole time, I think I'm going to lose three and a half days of my life, which is a little bit a little bit kind of crazy to think about. If we find that ingenu ingenuity cannot uh, take flight, does that mean that the entire idea of doing a powered flight on Mars is kind of out, or is that just like that this particular demonstration might not have worked? I think it's most likely going to be the latter, right? So if we don't achieve flight for some reason, we're still going to get data. We're still going to try, you know, we'll, we're going to understand what happened, right? Like, why is it that we can't fly? Where where in this whole thing did our math break down, right? Um, and. I think the idea is that we would try again. You know, we would we would try to understand what happened and try again. And so there certainly is an atmosphere on Mars. So there's no reason why we couldn't fly. It's just that getting the right ratio, the right speed, the right size of blades versus the size of the helicopter, all those things have been fine-tuned based on our understanding of Mars. And it might just be that Mars throws a surprise at us and that we need to go revisit some of that and try again. So. Either way, it's not going to be a failure, right? That's that's kind of the point of technology demonstrations, right? We are trying something. 
The first time we tried to fly on Earth, we didn't succeed. The second time we didn't succeed, right? It took hundreds of times um, for us to succeed. Doesn't mean that we couldn't fly on Earth. It just means that we hadn't found that right ratio, uh, that right formula to get us to get the flight. So I think it's going to be the same story at Mars. Does it have cameras on board? Will we be seeing like aerial photos of Mars or are there instruments that might be collecting data that's interesting? What are some of those kinds of data streams that you're looking forward to getting from the helicopter? So there's two cameras on board. There's a navigation camera that the helicopter uses as it's flying. And then there's another kind of angled camera that's a color camera. And so we are actually hoping to get images from that also, both when it's on the ground and flying. Um, and so we'll be seeing kind of Mars from a different eye, from a different lens. Uh, so that's going to be really interesting. The, the helicopter itself also has an altimeter, so it's able to know what altitude it's at. It also has onboard instrumentation to know uh, what orientation it's in. And so all of that data is going to be really, really um, great to see. But I am really looking forward to getting those first pictures like sort of from <laughs> the air because that's that's a different view of Mars. That's not something that we get to see normally, right? Our rover cameras are incredible, but they're a certain point of view. Um, so those helicopter images are, are going to be quite surreal to see. I'm wondering about the implications for other uh, uh, flights on solar system bodies. Are there targets beyond Mars that you think would be particularly good for a helicopter to go to? Uh, like, you know, if you could send a helicopter anywhere in the solar system, where would you go? <laughs> well, NASA is actually already working on another aerial vehicle that, that would be going to Titan. And Titan's really interesting because we don't have the same problem as Mars. The atmosphere on Titan is actually really, really thick. Um, so there's a, another mission um, that, that will be going out there uh, in a few years. So certainly they're going to be learning from us, not necessarily in terms of the physics, because obviously gravity and, and, and the atmosphere is different on Mars, but they're going to be learning a little bit of what it takes to operate an aerial vehicle all the way, you know, on another planet, on another moon in that case, so far away with the delay, you know, the automation that's needed, the software that's needed. So, so all of that experience that we're going to be gathering this month is definitely useful for any type of aerial vehicle uh, because it's just so different from operating something on Earth. Yeah. Oh, I love the idea of going to Titan with a little copter. Oh my gosh, that's so right? cool. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, Titan is so fascinating. And uh, I'm sure that a lot of people are thinking about the implications for ingenuity going forward. And, um, you know, to, to that point, like when I hear these kinds of concepts that, you know, we have a helicopter on Mars now, we could have helicopters and aircraft and other planets um, and other moons in the solar system. It all sounds very science fiction to me, but I, I wonder, you know, from your perspective as an engineer, um, is this just like another day in the office for you or do you kind of get, get that science fiction feel from it as well? Oh, it's it's definitely not like another day in the office. It definitely <laughs> feels very surreal, right? Like the fact that we're even attempting to do this. I mean, we've flown on Earth for like just over a hundred years, and now I'm like I get to be part of the team that's flying on Mars. It's insane, uh, insane in a good way, I guess. But so no, definitely we we all feel the way that you feel, right? That it's it's just so exciting that we're even attempting to do this. That we've. We've put together something that is credible enough that we're going to go do this on another planet and we're going to learn from it no matter what happens. And it, it's just, yeah, I'm so stoked to be part of that team and to get to do this. And, and, uh, and you know, we're, we're writing the history books in some way, right? Like everything that we do is new. Deploying the helicopter on the ground was new. Attempting to, how do we commission a helicopter on another planet? How do we attempt a first flight? What does the flight campaign look like? Usually when we do something on, on Mars or in space, like, you know, you can call up someone that's done something similar before and they kind of help you out whenever you have a problem. No one's done this before. And so we're just kind of figuring it out um, as we go. And, and, and that's, you know, it's just, I think this is why we become engineers. That's why we become scientists to do this stuff. So, um, so it's definitely kind of on the edge, right? Of science fiction in real life, but, but hopefully that's that's how we push innovation, right? That's how we make changes by trying those hard things and and hopefully succeeding. Uh, but even if we don't, we're going to learn about you know about what it takes and try again next time. 
Well, that's part of what I really love about so much of the work that you do, because you're not only doing all this fascinating engineering work, you're very active in terms of advocating for younger people, um, women and diverse communities getting involved in in STEM research. Um, and, you know, I, I wonder if you could speak a little bit to, you know, say there's some young kid that never really thought that they would go into engineering or anything like this. Um, and they're watching Ingenuity's first flight and they just feel like that spark of inspiration. Like, what is your message to people like that who may not have thought of themselves in that context before, but kind of get a little bit excited when they see this? Uh, my message is that there's a place for everyone, right? And, and, and to be honest, whatever it is that your dream is, whatever it is that you're curious about, whatever gives you that spark, that same spark that you can probably see in my eyes right now, right? follow that path and I can tell you I cannot tell you how many times I failed along the way you know the number of exams I failed the number of internships that turned me down and you know the number of people that told me no or that where I felt that I didn't belong but it only took one yes it only took one success it only took one door open for me to be I get paid to live my dream right like that is pretty cool uh, I get be, to be part of a team that's making history I get to have fun at work every day um, and so, you know, if, if you, if this is something that's inspiring you, if there's something else that's going on and inspiring you, go learn about it, throw yourself in it, go for it, uh, because you're never going to get there if you don't try. And, um, and I cannot tell you how much of a joy it is to, to do something that you love every single day.